Welcome to our June auction, the Paris Collection Part 2. It is with some pride that we bring you this sale. Since 2012, the Paris family have held a special place in the hearts of us all here at Art and Object. That was a landmark occasion, and we very much hope that this auction, Part 2, is going to be another special occasion. In the meantime, Millie Paris has enjoyed living with these works in her apartment in Sydney, and we hope you'll take the time to read the fabulous essay that Millie has written for us and is included in the front of the catalogue. The auction is on Thursday at 6.30pm, so I hope that you'll be able to find time to come in and view the collection before then. And in the meantime, perhaps you'll enjoy watching highlights of the talk given by Orlando Claremont in the gallery here on Saturday. Hamish Keith, when he was interviewing my dad, said, is there an easy way of saying what your painting's all about? Bill said, no, not for me anyway. Otherwise I wouldn't bother painting. I'd just imitate each painting, the previous painting, and become a factory. Probably make a lot of money too. Let's begin by looking to the bottom right corner for a clue. Question mark. Claremont often included textual elements. You can see this first couch painting that he did, erotic couch. The title is inside the work. The second couch painting he did, probably the most famous Claremont in existence, Scarred Couch, The Auckland Experience. Again, you can see Scarred Couch, Auckland Experience. It's pretty legible. But what does this say? <coughs> Martin Edmund, in his excellent essay that accompanies this in the catalog, references this hieroglyphic nature of the signs. And he partially decodes it as a plus and a question mark, as in, and what, or what next. Been lucky enough to finally meet someone who Dad actually told what it says. I'm going to save that for the end. <laughs> but I would encourage everyone to look deeply into the painting, and from different viewpoints. <coughs> different viewpoints is essential. Phil himself said that was one of the goals of the triptych format. Now. It just so happens that you can see the three couch paintings are actually a triptych, separate paintings, but all in a series. And this is, although it's called Scarred Couch 2, is actually the third <coughs> couch painting. I think behind the chair, peeking through, is Phil himself. He's almost always in his works, staring back at us in one shape or form. I get a strong sense that this feminine Presence. I wouldn't call it demonic in any way. Maybe ghostly, ethereal, perhaps. I kind of, this is what I'm seeing here, is a hooded figure, side on, with a halo of sorts around it. No actual face. Face remains a mystery. The breasts are sort of implied here. The baby, Orlando, perhaps, down here. If there is a relationship going on here, it's maybe something about mothers. Fathers, sons, families. What did Tony Bliss think was going on in this painting? This is Tony Bliss talking. I do know how important the painting was to him, and that followed up on his first scarred couch, which he felt captured a lot of Auckland as he lived it, and which he saw justifiably as his masterpiece. I can note two important things about the painting that might not be well known. Phil was very particular about how you viewed it, and he showed me one of its secrets. He positioned me in front of it, about two metres away, where I was able to take the whole painting in to be enveloped by it. After I had absorbed it a while, he then carefully stepped me back about a further metre, and the whole painting switched on and blazed with light. This was a calculated and wondrous effect. I haven't had time to try it, but I encourage us all to try it. You will notice at the bottom of the painting that there are letters in the tabletop, though they are hard to decipher. I asked Phil about these, and he told me that they say, I love it. Another masterpiece. I L O V E I T. I love it. That's the end of Tony talking back to me. I also look, now I see I E V O L V E it. I evolve it. Maybe that's the beauty of it. That maybe it doesn't say one thing. Maybe there are multiple things that can be read in this same sort of text. In conclusion, I'm going to blatantly rip off Martin Edmund's book and quote him 
directly. In retrospect, Philip Clemont's work seems complete. It falls naturally into three parts, like a huge triptych. Inferno, Purgatorio, Paradiso. The left-hand panel, the early work, seethed with the grotesque, the barbarous, the demonic, all dancing in the light emanating from those magnificent fireplaces. At the heart of the centre panel is a crucifixion, with its attendant mirrors, wardrobes, kidney tables, staircases and altarpieces. The right-hand panel, which is this period here, is a paradise. The nudes, the couches, the vases of flowers, the still lifes, the windows. The chairs he painted all his whole working life are within from which, paradoxically, the whole may be viewed. The chairs proliferate, as do images of himself, reminders that as we look, someone is looking back at us. Because in his brief career, this was Philip Clemont's constant exhortation. Even if it means an involvement in forces and experiences, both dangerous and uncompromising, we have to look if we want to see. Thanks.